right. Welcome everyone who is watching via Commitment dot online commitment online thank god for his uh, providential plan to be able to uh, serve you in this capacity in the midst of our our climate as a country um, and we just pray that god will uh, preserve you preserve our nation preserve the world and uh, accomplish his perfect plan in us and through us uh, today and in the future so again, welcome to Commitment Online, and uh, just want to let you know that we're suspending our previous sermon series, which I've entitled for you, Can't Come Down. Uh, we were surveying the book of Nehemiah, uh, but then we're going to transition into just a series of sermons as the Lord leads um, from today on to be able to provide you a bit of encouragement uh, during our time again uh, in this COVID-19 uh, crisis that we have found ourselves in. Um, next week, though, uh, for the record, it's going to be an exciting week. It's going to be a time of prayer and worship. So we want you to make sure you tune in during this time of what we have called and deemed here at Commitment. It is called POW, the POW service, power of worship. So a time that we're going to pray and sing and pray and sing and just really uh, ask God to do some amazing things in our hearts. So if you can, let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this awesome opportunity to be in your presence. Uh, despite of what is going on around us, uh, Lord, to help us to keep healthy balance in you. Help us to realize, God, that in spite of the, the importance to prepare and to care, God, help us, Lord, to make sure that we press into you. Uh, Jesus, help us to keep our eyes fixed on you, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Help us, God, because you, Jesus, will help us uh, remain steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the good work of the Lord. And we just uh, pray even for a spirit of creativity to be afresh upon your church, that we may creatively be able to still uh, present the gospel of Jesus Christ in whatever kind of means and, and opportunities you will present before us. So Spirit of God, please now come, be with us, speak to our hearts, um, remove the obstacles and hindrances that will impede our ability to hear clearly from you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So sometimes in our lives, uh, it, it is clear that our, our vision will get blurred, especially as you get older, of course, uh, your, your sight seemingly begins to fail. Uh, but it's interesting that um, as followers of Jesus Christ uh, and as a human being in general, it's very easy to uh, begin to get blurred vision uh, and, and our view upon life and our view of others and our view even of ourselves begin to become skewed and distorted and even uh, fuzzy. Uh, many of us, or many people, if you would, started uh, the year 2020 with a plethora of slogans. You know, 2020 was a, a great opportunity to develop catchphrases and even make a great profit from this particular uh, year. But the reality is this, uh, no matter how many churches try to uh, leverage 2020, uh, the church in itself uh, I must say, really has lost its way. Uh, it's lost its way via uh, the ultimate purpose and destiny that, that Christ uh, has established and fulfilled for his church uh, worldwide. And that is ultimately to fulfill the, the Great Commission. And that, that was his departing words. And it was very important for us to, to maintain, retain, and, and re uh, remain focused, if you would, upon what he truly uh, desires us to be and to represent as the church. But in any event, our vision has become blurred individually and even collectively as the church. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verse, first part of verse 7 really describes how our vision uh, can and does begin to become blurred. It says this, you're looking at things as they are outwardly. Uh, it's very easy when we begin to look at things outwardly, we can lose our way. We can uh, lose sight that this, this, this walk and this life that we live, it's by faith 
in the Son of God who loved us and gave his, his very life for us. So when you look deeper uh, into this one key word that really answers the question, how does our vision become blurry? The word outwardly means this. It is the appearance of one uh, pr presents by his, uh, his wealth or poverty. In other words, the, the appearance that one will present to others by his wealth or even his poverty, his rank or low condition. It is also outward circumstances, external conditions used in expressions denoting one's judgment and even treatment of others. So here you find uh, when we become a church or when we become individuals that has this blurry vision, you find four things uh, that we can extract, if you would, from this particular uh, uh, word outwardly. The first is this. Again, blurred vision is on, uh, only sees things economically, right? The appearance one re represents or presents by his wealth or, or even, listen to this, it's poverty, right? His poverty. So there's this economic way of seeing things. Secondly, blurred vision only sees power rankings. In other words, his rank or lower condition. Where are you fitting on this power scale, right? You hear a lot of conversations uh, talking about one's power and one's, uh, one's rank. But then you see the third uh, a point of this outwardly blurred vision, if you would, is that blurred vision only sees physical conditions. It, it is this outward circumstance, this external condition of a person, of a situation. And then the fourth you find in this word outwardly is that blurred vision only sees people from the outside in, right? In other words, when we see people from the outside in, it's really not seeing people through the eyes of Jesus Christ. You see, through the eyes of Jesus Christ, uh, peop uh, people are seen healed, they're seen set free, they're seen made whole, they see, they're seen delivered, not based upon what we see from the outside looking in. So the, the, the big question today is then is this, how do we begin to be people or the church that begins to correct our vision, right? How do we have our laser surgery on the eyes of the church? Again, if we go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and looking at verses 1 through 7, I believe we can identify some corrective measures, I believe, that can uh, allow us to, if you would, uh, not wear contacts lenses anymore, not wear uh, bifocals anymore, but ultimately have this correct correction that occurs in all of our eyesight so that we can see cor uh, correctly and be that church that God has called us to be. So here's the first that is found in verses 1 through 3, or primarily in verse 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. It says, Now I, Paul, myself urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am meek when face to face with you, but bold towards you when I'm absent. I ask that when I am present, I need not be bold with confidence with which I propose to be courageous against some who regard us as if we walked according to the flesh. Verse 3 is our primary verse in this first point. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. So here is our first corrective measure uh, to make sure that we develop true 2020 vision is that we must learn to war while we walk. We must learn to war while we walk. We cannot... Stop warring while we're walking on this earth, while we're living in this earth. We cannot stop walking, right, in the midst of the war. So let's go drill down this deeper, okay? It says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. So you look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. It shows us how walking in the flesh, if you would, should look for us. It says, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. And I'm sure we could say amen to that, right? For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy. So, so we know that, that we don't have to imagine these things anymore because they are happening grotesquely even in our, our life today. And it says, verse 3, unlovingly, okay, in, in, irreconcilable. Think about how many relationships are irreconcilable these days. Malicious gossips. Well, go figure that. Without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, 
lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, right? Sounds like uh, many churches today, right? Holding to a form of godliness, although have they, they have denied its power. Now listen to how we should walk in this. Avoid such men as these. <laughs> right? So our responsibility as we war while we walk is to avoid, we, we are to avoid people who are lovers of selves, lovers of money, money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedience to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, right? Irreconcilable, malicious gossips, people who lack self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, deceited, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness and, and denying its power. Listen, as we war while we walk, we are to avoid men and women who look like this. And we, we must be men and women who avoid looking like this. But then this is how we should war while we are walking. Paul elaborates in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. It says, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. And trust these to faithful men who, and women who will be able to teach others Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier in Christ Jesus. No soldier, it says, in active service entangles himself, it says, in the affairs of everyday life, so that he may please the one who enlisted him, right? So we're enlisted soldiers of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, right? Jesus is our commander in chief, and we are to not entangle ourselves with anything that is not like him. This is warring while we are walking. But let's go deeper. 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 2, verses 8 uh, through 13 gives us even more. It says, remember then Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship, even to imprisonment as a criminal. But the word of God is not imprisoned. You hear that? The word of God is not in prison. For this reason, I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen. Why? So that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. It is a trustworthy statement. Listen to verse 11 through 13. For if we died with him, we will then what? Also live with him. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, it's not I who live, but it's Christ who now what lives in me. Warring while walking. If we endure, we will also reign with him. Listen, warring while walking, must, we must be men and women who are walking victoriously, right? We're not walking defeated. We're not walking as though we have lost the victory, but the victory is won where in Christ Jesus. But then listen to what he says in verse 12. If we deny him, he will also what? Deny us. So conversely, we should be men and women, what? Who do, don't what? Deny him. Then we know with great confidence he will never deny us. Then lastly, verse 13, it says, if we are faithless, there will be times that we grow weak, we'll, be, we'll grow weary. He remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Amen? How do, does our vision become blurry? We have this outward look with this outward vision, but we must begin to take corrective measures in improving our vision. And the first we find, again, in verse 3, is that we must war while we walk. So listen, warring while we're walking, or walking and warring, they're the same thing at the same time when we have careful balance in the Spirit of God. Amen? But then we also find in verses 4 through 5, the first part of verse 5, and all, uh, verse 4 all the way through the first part of verse 5. It says this, again, back in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It says, for, our, for our, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thought raised up against the kingdom of God, right? So let's deep, look deeper at this. So we war while we walk, and we're walking while we're warring. 
We must then become men and women who understand that we must work to rebuild. There's this destruction and this destroying. If not, let's skip down to verse 5. I'm so apologize in verse 5. Um, we have verse 5. It says, uh, we are destroying speculations and every lofty thought raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So that's where we want to land right there for point number two is that we must become men and women who realize that there is this, this work to rebuild, that we are making sure that of how we are uh, reasoning with ourselves and also relying upon different people, our different uh, capacities that we ma- must have. Let's, let's go further in this verse number five, okay? It says, for the destruction of fortresses. This word fortress means this, anything on which one relies, anything on which one relies. Think about this. You must ask yourself the question, if I have weapons that are for our warfare and that they are for power for, de- for destruction, I must be a man or woman who understands that they are for what? Destroying and what? Overcoming fortresses. And these fortresses are this, anything or anyone, anything that anyone relies upon. So anything that you are relying upon becomes this fortress, right? And our, and our human tendency is to build these fortresses around ourselves, right? When times and climates that we have, even today, we build this fortress around ourselves. We build our fortress by going out and buying tons and hoarding toilet paper, hoarding bottles of water. And we try to think that we're going to build this fortress upon around ourselves. In other words, we're relying upon some other kind of resource or some other kind of a privilege or opportunity that, that we may have around us. So the question we must always ask ourselves is, what weapons are we relying on? Am I relying upon self-made weapons? Am I relying on self-made uh, uh, opportunities that, that are in my power, if you would, uh, to, to grab off the shelf, if you would? But then you also see in verse 5 as well, we are destroying speculations. The word speculation means this. It is those things that are raised up against the kingdom of God, such as one's counsel or some reasoning that is hostile to the Christian faith. So think about that. Speculations are those things that are contrary to the Christian faith. So whenever we're in particular positions or peculiar positions, there will always be the tendency to rely upon, again, other counsel, other reasonings that are contrary to the Christian faith contrary to what thus saith the Lord. So our responsibility is to to really ask ourselves the question, what counsel, what reasoning am am I trying to win this war with? You see, the scripture says in a multitude of counsel, there is safety, but what kind of counsel are we receiving, right? By wise counsel, we wage war and we find victory. But again, the question will always be, well, what kind of counsel am I uh, am I accumulating, if you would, along the way? You know, are there people speaking the, that, those things that are contrary to Christ? Well, I don't need that counsel, right? But those people that are speaking in support of Christ and the Christian faith, that those are the, those that I need in my life who will give me the counsel and the reasoning that I need. So again, we need to work to rebuild. We need to work to to make sure we're determining how we're reasoning and what we are relying upon. But then lastly, you find in verse 5 again, is that that there's this every lofty thing that is raised up against the kingdom of God. The word lofty thing means this, pride or some kind of prideful adversary. Again, adversary against what? The kingdom of God. So we must realize that even in our own pride or the pride of others, In other words, pride is simply thinking that I can do this thing apart from God. I don't have a correct estimate of myself. I believe I can, I will, I have the capacity, rather than great humility, uh, if you would, opposite of pride is realizing that God can, God will, God has the capacity, I can't, and I do not have the capacity. So we must begin to realize that, you know, why do I think that my weapons are better than God's weapons, right? So what we find here in this second point of working to rebuild our reasoning and working to rebuild what we're relying upon is that if we choose not to rebuild this in our thinking and go, if you were always going through this daily demolition, this daily uh, destroying of fortresses and speculations and lofty things, if we don't go through this daily activity, you can rest assured that 
the weapons that God has given to us will, will, will be deemed powerless. We will find ourselves in situations and circumstances that will become overwhelmed. They will, they, will, they will affect us emotionally, mentally, and even spiritually, and even physically sometimes, because we are trying to work through the situations and circumstances under our strength, under our, our resources, relying upon our weapons, relying upon our intellect, our own power, right? our own giftedness, our own skill sets, or even the skill sets of others. Amen. So we must realize, again, we must war while we walk. We must we become men and women who work to rebuild, work to rebuild. And then thirdly, we find also in verse uh, number five in Second Corinthians chapter 10, it says we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So the last part of verse five, it says, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Well, let's keep reading verse six. And it says, and we then are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is what? Complete. So it's interesting that these two verses are tied together, right? Is that we're able to take every thought captive or when we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And then we're ready to do what? Punish all disobedience whenever your uh, obedience is complete. So, so we need to really park at that, that latter part of verse five. Uh, and come up with a third point, which is we must work to reboot our minds, reboot our minds, right? It's like a computer. Every now and then it gets some viruses. Every now and then it gets corrupted. Every now and then it just needs to be refreshed. And there comes a time in our lives, right? And, and times and conditions that we're in today, like today, it really shows us many times where our minds are really fixed, where our minds really go uh, because they haven't been refreshed they have not been rebooted regularly. So again, taking every thought captive. The word captive means this, to captivate. So think about that. I am captivating my mind. Or what is captivating my mind? Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9, one of my favorite passages, it says this. And it suggests where our mind should dwell on. It says, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is good repute, if there is any lex excellence and if anything worthy of praise, it says dwell on these things, the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and then the God of peace will be with you. And I'm sure today, many of you today need the God of peace to be with you. Well, the key will be, okay, what is captivating my mind? Or where is my mind going to? Or what is my mind dwelling upon? The word dwell means this. What is my mind counting? What is my mind making an account of? Right? In other words, we can have stuff that enters our mind, leaves our minds. Enters our mind, leaves our mind. What's, what's the balance sheet, if you would, of your mind? The last definition of this word dwell means to meditate on. What are you thinking on regularly? What are you allowing to consume you? What are you focusing on, right? Because the reality would be this. What you think on long enough is what you're going to begin to believe. What you believe is what you begin to, get, begin to live out and, and walk in and trust in. So the more we begin to think on, on the things of God, dwell on the things of God, right? Allow the things of God to intrude our space and time. We will begin to become, become men and women who uh, live out the word of God with great clarity um, uh, as it is, it is given to us uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit. But why do this? Why should we dwell on, on, on the things of God? Why should we allow the word of God to take precedent and resident in our lives? Well, Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 says this. Now, keep in mind, the reality is this. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will begin to what? Speak. So think about that. So Matthew 12, 36 says this. I'll tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an account for it in the day of judgment. Right? So think about all the conversation you're having during this climate. Right? Every careless word, you and I will give an account in the day of judgment. So, so to me, that really says that I need to begin to tend to my mind, which causes me to act and say certain things. 
Therefore, there, the, the, the fact that and the urgency that Romans 12 gives us, verses 1 through 3, is, becomes vitally important. Listen to what it says. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world. It says, right? It says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In the climate we're in right now, it is so easy to be conformed to this world. Again, all the information, all the information we're processing, right? Everything that we're intaking, everything that, that you know, all the garbage, and even some of the reputable information that we're receiving. If we continue to lean on that more and more and more and more than we lean upon the word of God, that inevitably is going to be what we are being washed with. And that is what we're going to begin to be conformed into, right? So our responsibility is to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, it says, so that you may prove the will of God, what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and also perfect. And I think, again, in our current climate, many of us need what is good, what is acceptable, and what is also perfect to be uh, forever on our minds. So rebooting our mind, listen, uh, with the word of God helps you and I navigate through life's obstacles. So it's important and, and it's, it's vital for each one of us to become men and women who reboot, refresh, reboot, refresh by allowing the word of God to just wash over us and, and cleanse us, right? How can a young man keep his way clean, right? By hearing to the word of God. I hide the word of God in my heart that I what? Well, not what? Sin against you. So the word of God allows us to navigate through life. Rebooting with the word of God also helps us fulfill the will of God, right? It helps us do the will of God. Because the more we have the word of God in us, the more that we will exercise and live out the word of God. So we must learn to walk while we war. We must become men and women who work to rebuild. And we, we must be going through demolition in our lives over and over again and rebuilding things, rebuilding our reasoning, rebuilding what we rely upon if we want to be men and women who exercise and utilize the, the weapons of righteousness. Amen. And then thirdly, we must become men and women who work to reboot our minds over and over again. And then lastly, today, we find in verse 7, it says, We are looking at things outwardly as they are outwardly. If anyone is confident in himself that he is Christ, that you belong to Christ, let him consider this again within himself, that just as he is Christ, so also are we. Think about that. So many times we can migrate through life and we can lose our focus and forget that we are Christ. Let me read that again to you. If anyone is confident in Christ, that he is confident in himself, that he is Christ, that you belong to Christ, apostrophe Christ, apostrophe S, let him consider this again within himself. So if you think you are in him and that you are his there's times in our lives that you and I will have to reconsider do I really belong to him am I in him so if we want to correct our blurred vision we must become men and women who remain confident in Christ if anyone is confident in himself that he is Christ. Think about it. The confidence is not necessarily in me, but I am confident that I am where? In Christ. The word confident means this, to be, to be persuaded, that I must be persuaded in myself that I am Christ, in Christ, that I belong to Christ. I must become a man and woman who is persuaded that I trust in this truth that I confine in this truth, that I rely upon this truth, right? I believe why the scripture could be reminding us of this is because there are times we don't rely on this truth. We don't rely on the truth that, that our confidence should be that I am in 
Christ, that I belong to Christ, right? If any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So we must be persuaded. We must trust in, confide in. We must rely upon this truth, this enduring truth, and remain in this truth, remain confident in Christ, that our confidence is in him and him alone. So 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6 gives us confidence. It says this, Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Think about that. So if I believe in someone else other than Christ, you can say the promise or the confidence is I will be disappointed, right? And I'm, and I'm sure each one of us have been disappointed by our, our spouses, disappointed by our parents, disappointed by your employer, disappointed by any government official. But if your confidence in Christ is in Christ, he will never disappoint you. It's a wonderful promise he gives us. But then in Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 8, describes uh, how Paul passionately valued Christ. It says this, although I myself may have confidence in the flesh, right? Paul was a Pharisee upon Pharisees. He was a Jew above Jews. He was astute. He was educated. He was all that. But he says, although I myself might have confidence in the flesh, right? He says, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Verse 5, circumcise the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, which is in the law, found blameless. I don't, I could never say that, that I'm found blameless in the law. Could you? But then look at verse 7. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as lost for the sake of whom? Christ. So can you imagine if everyone was frantically doing this condition, running after Christ? Can you imagine if everyone was frantically lining up and waiting patiently to get to know Christ? Think about that. Think about if we place more value on Christ or in Christ than we do on anything that we even need today. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may do what? Gain Christ all the more. Think about that. That, that everything Paul was, everything that he, he excelled in, everything that he, he obtained in life, everything that he valued simply surmised as rubbish when it came to the value of knowing Christ Jesus, his Lord. You see, confidence in Christ is, is knowing that there is nothing that ever was that will ever be is more valuable, more important than Christ and Christ alone. How do we correct our blurred vision? We war while we walk. We work to rebuild. We work to reboot our minds, right? We got to renew those minds daily. Garbage in, garbage out, right? The word of God in, the word of God out. We must also remain confident in Christ because Christ is and will ever be the source of all things. So the big question we must end with is this. Are you Christ? Do you know confidently that you are Christ today? Right? So today, maybe there's some who, who've never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Uh, maybe you need to come to the conclusion that you are Christ. And how can you know if you're Christ? Well, through his finished work, he has literally paid the price for you already. But, but you must now make a choice to give up ownership. You must put your faith and trust in what he has done for you over 2,000 years ago, right? So today, if there's someone who's listening and you say, well, I don't know if I'm Christ or not, 
I don't know if I belong to him. I don't know if I'm in him or not. Can we pause right now just to pray with you or pray together uh, to make sure that you are Christ and that you are in him? Let's bow our heads. You can just repeat this simple prayer with me just to say, Jesus, I realize today that I have sinned against you because I've chosen to uh, chase after, pursue after anyone or anything but you. I thought I needed someone or something more than I needed you. Jesus, I realize that you came to die for me. You were buried for me. You rose again from the grave just for me. Jesus, please come into my heart, my life, to live forever. Take control of my life as I now put my trust in you and know that I am yours and you are mine and I am in you for the rest of my days and until I see you face to face. But then there's, there's another group of people maybe that I'm speaking to today that maybe you feel as though that your vision has become blurred, that, that you haven't been warring as you've walked. Maybe you, you haven't been continuously in that rebuilding mode. You have not destroyed the fortresses and destroyed speculations and destroyed lofty thoughts against uh, the kingdom of God. And you've just been following suit and falling in line with the ways and the thoughts of the world and, and those around you. You've been taking counsel of the unwise or those you have, uh, you have maybe deemed wise, but they have not been giving you the counsel of Christ. M maybe you've relied upon other resources, even including yourself. Maybe you thought that your ways were higher than his ways, better than his, more powerful than his. And then now you find yourself in a weak state or weakened state. Maybe today that you, you have not rebooted your mind and you just realize that, wow, I need to start renewing my mind. And I have, I have been allowing so many other things of the world to just consume the way I think, the way I see things. Uh, maybe you've lost your confidence in Christ or Maybe you have lost your way and maybe you have not been living in Christ even though you've been purchased by Christ. Today, maybe you need to just recalibrate your blurred vision. And I want to just read a last portion of scripture that I think it surmise both groups of, uh, surmise, I guess this, a great thought, a great principle, a great thing to realize what God could be doing in your life today uh, for both groups of people, those who maybe are not in Christ or not belonging to Christ, or maybe you just pray with me and you now feel that you are belonging to Christ, but yet those who say, I have belonged to Christ, but I haven't been living in Christ. I've been kind of doing my own little thing today or in times past. Uh, there, there's a very, very important part of scripture I'd like to read to you. It says this, for he, this is Jesus, rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transformed us, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth visible and invisible, whether a thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Again, I believe during the times that we live in, um, it's almost like this, this challenge that, that we're faced with. Will I allow Christ to become first place or will I allow Christ to remain first place? And, and I think uh, God creatively allows certain things to happen in our lives to, to accomplish this. I believe he allows 
catastrophic events. He permits sickness. He permits just life to fall apart, literally, for two reasons, I believe. To become first place, to remain first place. So in your life today, where is Christ Is he first place or not? Will you allow him to become first place? Will you allow him to remain first place in your life? And when he becomes first place, you can rest assured that you'll be able to be a man and woman, young or old, who can war while you walk. And you will always be walking while you war. And you will always be that person who understands that, man, I got to always be in this Real be rebuilding mode that I got to continue to tear down fortresses. I got to tear down speculations. I got to tear down lofty thoughts. And I got to rebuild with the things of God. I have to renew my mind continuously, renew my mind over and over and over again. Because as the more I live in this world, this world can overtake me and consume me very easily. And in doing this, doing so, we will always remain in him and we'll be confident that, that we are in him and we are Christ. Could you pray with me in closing? Father, we thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the finished work of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for the power of the Holy Spirit that enables we, your people, to live lives that are holy and acceptable before you, even in an unholy world. Uh, thank you, God, that the power of your Holy Spirit, through the finished work of Jesus Christ, gives us the victory, God, in spite of whatever's going on around us. We are victorious in him and through him and by him because of you, Jesus. Father, help us, Lord, during this climate that we're in, the season that our country is in, the season that this world is in today. Help us, God, to run to you, the author and the perfecter of our faith, in the matchless, most powerful, magnificent name of Jesus Christ, we all said, amen.
agenda I'm sorry When I forgot that you're enough Take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you Not just one joining us uh, via commitment online please uh, spread the word that uh, for the foreseeable future we're going to have to do ministry this way uh, for the most part um, every Sunday 9 11 as well as 1 p.m. in Espanol so uh, feel free to to repost uh, the service feel free to pass on the link commitment dot online commitment dot online or you can go directly to youtube and subscribe to our channel then you can get alerts there uh, the, the message will also be posted to facebook later on but in the meantime we thank you so much for being with us stay encouraged uh, make sure you stay prayed up make sure that you lean into this and believe that God is going to do something special that our children and our children's children can talk about for generations. Believing that, that we're on a cutting edge, the, the, the bleeding edge of the blood of Christ, literally to do something transformational uh, in our day, to see the world turn upside down or right side up with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So make sure you're being sight, uh, uh, light in, in, in the dark world, that people can see your light in the dark world. Make sure that you're the salt of the earth um, so people can taste the savoriness of Jesus Christ. Let your words be seasoned with salt, making sure that you're not speaking something um, that, that is not healthy, but speak life into this situation. And just know as well, as we head into the week, uh, Thursday at 8 o'clock, we're going to have our online engage group on Facebook. We encourage you to join us there as well. All right. Love you dearly. So let's pray. Father, we pray that you bless your people, that you will keep your people, that you will let your face, your grace, my God, shine upon them. God, I pray that they will prosper and be in health, even as their soul prospers and, and, and is in health. God, I pray for our nation. I pray you, you would just dispatch your heavenly angels, Lord, to, in it, to encamp around your, this nation and even the world. Those who are even sick and shut in, God, I pray that you will bring uh, quick healing in their lives. And God, I pray that you will cause this virus to subside and to cease in the name of Jesus. And Father, we look forward to, again, the amazing fruit that's going to come out from this journey. We trust in you and to, we lean not to our own understanding in this context that we're in today. And Father, we pray against the spirit of fear, but we pray that you would endow us, Lord, with a spirit of love, power, and a sound mind, God that can only be found in Christ and Christ alone. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your unfailing love towards us and the precious and, again, the most powerful name of Christ. We all said amen. God bless you, and thanks for joining us today. <laughs>